Let's see. Hello, class. How are you? Thanks for joining me. I'm sorry I wasn't here yesterday. I had a... I was exhausted. I was exhausted. I was exhausted. I was napping. By that time, I was napping. I mean, I came, woke up, whatever. I, I was napping. So, I think we're going to try it. We'll see. I might do double time and finish the story today. I always lengthen the end of a story out because I I'm sad when I'm done with a, a book that I really liked and I really like this book so I'm gonna be a little sad when I'm all done things best forgotten I like to believe that our dear mother watched over me that day maybe it is wishful to think that them in heaven are concerned with those of us on earth but something kept me alive because by rights I should have been killed six times over the first is a hail of bullets zinging past my ears as I put heels to that rebel pony and gallop out of the farmyard. No saddle nor bridle to steer by, just me clinging to the mane for dear life and bullets cleaving the air like invisible knives. It reminds me of what George Washington, you know, I heard that too, in one of the things I was watching on him, that two horses were killed out from underneath him and that there were several bullet holes in his coat and never did he he wasn't wounded once and the indians thought because of that that he was um he was a higher power a spiritual being and so that just is reminding me of homer p fig the next is not a mile away when when an artillery shell lands so close I can feel the heat as it explodes and smell the dirt in the air. Then I'm galloping the stolen pony through clouds of smoke, over ro rolling fields, over a railroad track, past thousands of soldiers, massed to attack, and rolling, and rolling batteries of artillery cannon and startled men who shake their heads as me and the pony fly by running for our lives. Somehow the poor animal seems to understand that I want to go through the gray Confederate lines and head for the Union Blue. Or maybe it's just so spooked that it runs straight at what frightens it most. Time and again, shells explode, tearing up the ground, knocking down trees, and making soldiers vanish, leaving nothing behind but their boots. I cling to the pony as if in a bad dream, although it is nothing like the war in my nightmares where I have seen Harold die a hundred times. In nightmares, the noise of war is not louder than a thousand thunderstorms or as blinding as a thousand bolts of lightning. In nightmares, it never smelled so bad. In nightmares, I do not hear the cry of wounded horses and think that it is worse than the crying of wounded men because the animals do not understand what has happened to them or why they have been shot down. That's an extraordinary paragraph right there, right? So it, So when you have a nightmare it does not fill your senses like this filled his senses i'm going to read it again and nightmares i cling to the pony as if in a bad dream although it is nothing like the war in my nightmares where i have seen harold die a hundred times and nightmares the noise of war is not louder than a thunder thousand thunderstorms or as blinding as a thousand bolts of lightning. In nightmares, it never smelled so bad. In nightmares, I do not hear the cry of wounded horses and think that it is worse than the crying of wounded men because the animals do not understand what has happened to them or why they have been shot down. Oh, my God. My God, how you express what war really is. Men and horses are dying all around me, and yet on I ride, on and on and on spurring the pony and my bare heels expecting to be struck at any moment like the pony fear like the pony fear keeps me going that and anger at being so scared i keep riding and riding through bullets and bombshells because i am furiously afraid to stop moving stopping is where the world explodes stopping is certain death it seems to me jesus has gone before us uh, in many forms. That's what it seems to me. He has gone before us in many forms, so he really does understand every bit of every uh, trial and tribulation that we have. That's what it seems to me. And that, and we've seen it in examples in Scripture where, um, where um, oh my gosh, 
Joshua is said to be in a different, in Jesus, Jesus in a different form. They don't say that about David, but they say that about Joshua. They also say that about somebody else. I can't remember right now. In that mad ride across the field of battle, I see many things. Artillery shells skipping along the ground like rocks being skipped on a pond. A cavalry officer drawing his pistol to put down his wounded horse. And then himself falling lifeless before he can pull the trigger. Men digging like dogs in the dirt to get away from the deadly hail of lead. Spent bullets spattering like hard rain on the broken ground. Trees burning like Christmas candles. Thirsty men sucking sweat from their woolen sleeves. A dead man on his knees with his hands folded as if to pray. Things too terrible to write for fear the page will burn. Things best forgot. I am reading that and I, I'm sorry I wish I was reading it and sh trying to show you what I was reading because you can see that it's written as if it's a poem right as if it's a poem it almost has a, a beat to it right almost like psalms as well right psalms psalms are written in this kind of uh, where it's got a hidden beat to it Later, someone told me I must have covered five miles or more from the rebel-held farmhouse to the Union lines at Culp's Hill. To me, it felt longer than forever. After a while, I could not bear the fearsome thumping of the artillery or the bee buzz of the bullets or the crying of man and beast. It's as if my ears have been stuffed with thick cotton, muffling the noise of war. The only thing I can really be sure of is my own heart slamming and the beating heart of the pony as we ride on through the uh, as we ride on through the carnage leaping over the dead and dying our peace our pace never slacking it's as if me and the pony exist all to ourselves inside the battle but somehow separate galloping on and on until suddenly the smoke clears away and there's a sloping hill in front of us and rows and rows of cannons pointing their dark black barrels right at me, speaking in puffs of white smoke, and I'm shouting back at the cannons, shouting for my brother, but I can't hear my own voice. The pony rears up and I lose my hold, falling with a hard thump to the rocky ground. Can't tell if I'm seeing stars or real shells exploding, and then rough hands grab me and pull me into a trench dug into the ground below the cannon. Bearded men in blue uniforms are shouting, but I can't make out what they're saying. Finally, one of them gives me water and covers my ears with a cool, damp cloth, and slowly my hearing returns. Who are you, boy? Have you lost your mind? Charging over a battlefield without so much as a sword or gun? That's madness. Four or five of our best sharpshooters were trying to cut you down. I don't know how they missed. Are you from Maine? I ask, gulping the water. Vermont, says the man with the water. Pulteney, Vermont. I, I never been to Maine nor anywhere else but here. I try to explain about my brother that he will be with a company of new recruits from Maine, but the Vermont man has no patience for my story. Medicine shows, pig-like human beings, Confederate spies, balloon rides. You're speaking nonsense, boy. You took a bad fall and it's gone to your head. Harold Fig, I insist. He's not yet 18. The Vermont man shrugs. There are drummer boys of 14 and even younger. Drummer boys no older than you. He was sworn to fight as a soldier, I try to explain, but the cannons fire directly over our heads, and once again my ears go deaf for a time. When the cannons are reloading for another salvo, the Vermont man hauls me over the top of the hill out of the line of fire and won't let me go until he's delivered me to his company sergeant. This boy was recovered on the field of battle, he yells to the sergeant. He's plumb crazy. What should I do? Send him to the rear, shouts the sergeant, pointing with the sword. All civilians to the rear. And he quick shouts about it, private. <clears throat> and be quick about it, private. The Johnny Rebs are coming again, sure as Christmas. They will mount one last assault before the sun sets. There are thousands of soldiers upon the hills and just behind it, and from the look, most have been fighting all day. The wounded are being loaded into wagons and will be carried to where the Union surgeons await. 
Just over the ridge, the cannons are booming, but here there are fires lit and camp stoves where coffee brews, and the men all seem calm and tired, but also full of purpose. They have seen the worst of war and are determined to keep fighting, the Vermont man says with great satisfaction. We stand our ground at last. He fetches a mug of hot black coffee and bids me drink it. Might be this will restore your sanity, he says. It must suffice, for I can't be babysitting a lunatic boy. I must return to my men before the next assault or be marked down as a deserter. Thank you, I say. I'm fine now. It was all the noise made my head crooked. It'll do that, he agrees and points to the wagon. Best thing, follow the wounded. That will get you a safe distance from the fighting. Don't know what became of your horse. I think it may still be running. I promise to follow the wagons of wounded and find safety in the rear, but as soon as he's out of sight, I skedaddle to another group of soldiers asking if any are from Maine. None are. They're all Pennsylvania volunteers and some from New York, and they know nothing of the regiments from Maine or where they might be located. Before they can ask what a boy is doing on the battlefield out of uniform, I move on to the next group looking for my brother. Fact is, they're all too busy to take much notice of me or too tired to give chase. As the sun is going down, I finally came upon some men from Maine and ask if they have any figs along. Figs, son, figs? say one of the soldiers, grinning so hard his droopy mustache goes horizontal. How about apples or peaches? Would you settle for a pear? We have a private Charles Pear from Brunswick. Fig, I insist. Harold Fig from Pine Swamp. Never heard of Pine Swamp. Never heard of Harold Fig. Do you know what regiment, what division? All I know is he's my brother and he's in the army. And how did you come to be here, boy, looking for your brother? I'm so too exhausted to tell the story again, with or without the ornamentation. I come by train, I tell him, to keep it simple. All the way to Gettysburg by train? The last stretch by horse, I admit. The soldier studies me in the fading light. You look like you could use a meal, son. Why not join us? We are all Maine men here, though none called Fig. I must find my brother, I insist. Night falls, he warns. If you wander in the wrong direc direction, the pickets will shoot you. Can't find your brother if you're shot, can you? No, sir. Then join us for a little while, he suggested. Our cook is making soup in the big iron pot, a fine potato soup that we pretend is fish chowder. You can look for your brother tomorrow at first sight. If his company is within marching distance, they'll be on the move coming our way. All companies have been summoned to Gettysburg. One way or another, he'll be in the fight. Tomorrow, son, that's when you'll find him. I figure to have a little of that fine-smelling potato soup and then move along, keep looking. I settle down by the fire, spooning the soup out of a tin pan. Tastes as good as it smells. And then another soldier gives me his ration of hard tack and shows me how to soak it in the soup and I eat that too. Then when I'm about ready to set out again, dark or not, the regimental band decides to play and it seems impolite to sneak away, especially with so many familiar main voices raised in song. The Union forever. Hurrah, boys, hurrah. Down with the traitors, up with the stars. While we ra rally round the flag, boys rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. Later on, as my eyelids grow heavy, a soldier with a fine high tenor sings, Just Before the Battle Mother, a sad song about a boy telling his dear mother not to worry. And that's what carries me off to sleep, dreaming of mothers and brothers and sons. M is for Mutineer. Just before dawn, I am awakened by a tall, skinny soldier who finds me sleeping near the smoldering campfire. Is it really you, he asks, prodding my shoulder. Is it really Homer Fig? They said a boy named Fig. At first, I do not recognize him. So changed is he. It's true. It's me. Webster B. Willow, he says, formerly a clergyman, formerly acting on behalf of your uh, on behalf of your guardian, Mr. Brewster, formerly robbed and abandoned by the beautiful Kate Nibley and her so-called brother, now enlisted for my 
sins as Private Willow of the 5th Maine and come to beg for your forgiveness in case I am killed in the fighting. He removes his forage cap and looks at the ground as if ashamed to meet my eyes. It is I who was robbed and abandoned, I remind him, sitting up. He nods miserably. You tried to warn me, but I was a fool. Still am a fool, no doubt. Mr. Brewster trusted me to look after you, and I failed to do so. How long were you married? He shudders. A few hours, long enough to know I had been duped. Frank and Kate vanished as soon as we departed the ship. I searched for them on Park Avenue, presented myself at the Nibley mansion like a fool, still hoping we had been separated by accident, and was told enough to glean the truth. Their real name, whatever it is, cannot be Nibley. How did you find me? I asked, still a little groggy from sleep. Someone mentioned a boy named Fig searching for his brother. To be truthful, I debated most of the night whether or not I should make myself known to you. I still ain't found Harold. Private Willow shifts uncomfortably and clears his skinny throat. That's the other thing I have to tell you. After I mustered in New York, after I yeah must after I was mustered in New York, joining this regiment, I briefly met another new recruit named Harold Fig. We were on the same troop train for part of the journey. He looks a lot like you, but larger, of course. I recognized him at a glance. You met my brother? Where is he? Did you say I was coming to get him? Private Willow shakes his head in misery. I, um, I failed to confess to him my association with you out of shame and despair. I don't care about that, I say, leaping to my feet. Where's Harold? Private Willow finally looks me in the eye. He is with Colonel Chamberlain's men. The tw I know I always get those mixed up. The 12th Maine. They are marching from Hanover and should be here in a few hours' time. It takes a moment for me to understand what he's saying. So Harold wasn't in Gettysburg yesterday when it all started. He ain't been in the battle yet. He ain't been wounded or killed. Private Willow puts on his forge cap and sets it straight. He soldiers his rifle and throws his narrow soldiers back as if at attention. I cannot say how your brother fares, young sir, but his regiment has not yet joined the battle. They must do so today. Today we all fight, every last man of us. <clears throat> the Johnny Rebs will do the same. Many thousands are sure to die. Are you afraid, I ask? He hesitates, not as much as I was, having spoken to you, but mighty fearful just the same. I take Private Willow's hand and give it a quick squeeze. I have seen the elephant and you got nothing to be feared of. I tell him, that's a lie, but I owed him one and hopefully lies don't count as bad. Thanks to Private Willow, when the 20th Maine Infantry Regiment comes marching into Gettysburg, I'm there at the Hanover Road waiting to greet them. They come along at a brisk march, 350 men with a drum and fife keeping them as they kick up dust. They've been on the road for hours and look tired but determined. Some raise cheers, anxious to join the fight, searching for my brother's face among them. I'm thinking all of my adventures have been worth it because I get here in time to stop Harold from dying in battle. Surely he will be he will be amazed to see me and want to know how his little brother beat him to the war. Harold, I cry, Harold Fig. There's a fearsome looking sergeant carrying the regiment flag, holding it high and proud. He tries to ignore me, but after the men are told to be at ease, he plants the flag in the ground and crosses his big arms and gives me a stern look. What do you want, boy? Don't you know this is a war? Go on home to your mother. I want to see my brother Harold Fig, I insist. He started out as a private, but it's certain he's been promoted by now. The sergeant gets a look on his face like he swallowed a bad egg. He spits prodigiously and snarls. Harold Fig, bah! He's been promoted, all right. Promoted to the rear? Promoted to corporal or to colonel? He's in irons, you young fool, the sergeant roars. Arrested and under guard. Now be off. After the fighting starts, away with you. 
Harold arrested? I assume the blurry sergeant is having a joke at my expense. A bad, cruel joke. But when I go around to the back of the regiment where some rickety wagons and a few horses have been brought up to join the fight, another soldier tells me that if I want to see Private Harold Fig, I will have to parley with the guards. And one of the wagons under guard of three armed soldiers are five or six prisoners, each with a large, crude M, chalked upon their blue uniform. N M is for mutineer, a guard tells me, showing me his piece of chalk. That's my idea. The M will be something to aim at as they're trying away, as they're try as they try running away. Ha ha. The guard's laughter is cruel, as if he thinks he's made a funny joke and don't doesn't care who it hurt. One of the prisoners, a Scurvy looking fellow with a black eye is my brother Harold. When I call his name, he covers his face and weeps. One small hill. I can't imagine a younger brother seeing his older brother in, you know, shackles like that and then weeping besides. All my life I never knew Harold to be scared or ashamed, and seeing him this way is like stepping backward off a cliff or discovering the world has gone inside out and upside down. I sit next to where he crouches in the wagon and tries not to look at his black eye and try not to look at his black eye or notice the sickly unwashed smell of him. Homer, what are you doing here? He asks, his voice catching. Thought I'd take a stroll behind the barn, and this is where I ended up. I give him a playful nudge. I come looking for you, silly, to tell you it was nothing but a trick making you enlist in the army. Squint told, sold you for a substitute and kept the money. They fooled you into enlisting. It ain't legal. Harold hangs his head, his voice so small. I have to lean in close. Don't matter now, Homer. I went and done it and will be court-martialed. What happened, I asked. Did you run from the bullets? Did you run from the cannon? From men with bayonets? My brother shakes his head. Somewhere in all his sorrow, there comes a slight chuckle. Disobeyed my squad sergeant. I swear he's worse than squint. Is that what happened to your eye? He nods. At first I liked it, being in the regiment. The fine uniforms and the drilling, shooting rifles, three good meals a day, sleeping in tents. I even liked the marching and folks cheering as we went by. But I never did like the sergeant telling me what to do without so much as please or thank you. And one day I told him so. <clears throat> when he objected, I slung him down in the mud just like I did squint. It got worse from there, he adds. He took it upon himself to make my life a misery. Said I was swamp trash, not fit to serve. So you ran away? Didn't get far, as you can see. What will happen? It doesn't matter, little brother. I am disgraced. You must leave here and forget you ever knew me. Don't be stupid. That sergeant has knocked the sense right out of you. I mean it, Homer. You need to get away from here. Whatever happened yesterday, whatever you might have seen, it's nothing to what will happen today and tomorrow and every day until one side or the other is defeated. Couldn't be worse than yesterday, I tell him. Oh, yes, it could. The Union has 90,000 men and will use, all, use them all. The Rebels, a similar number. Can't you hear the artillery pounding away? It has started already. It ain't fair, I say. Fair doesn't signify. I swore an oath and disobeyed. I must be punished. Do they hang mutineers? mutineers? Sometimes, mostly not. Likely they'll send me to prison. Up to now, I've been trying to act cheerful, pretending things ain't so bad, but the prospect of Harold being sent off to prison in disgrace makes me gloomy and quiet. Probably they won't let me go off to prison with him. I'll have to visit and smuggle in a saw so he can make an es his escape. Then we'll r run away as far as we can get, as far as Western territories maybe, where land is free and nobody cares what happened in the war. We'll grow so much corn that we'll get fat as ticks and build us a a fine house with a fireplace and windows and a proper and a proper privy. We'll fish in mountain streams for trout as big as dogs and someday we'll sit in rockers on the porch and reminisce about the silly old days when that when the stupid rotten sergeant blackened his eye and how we made our escape maybe on horseback 
or in a silk balloon. I ain't decided which yet. It will be all right, I tell him. Our dear mother always said things work out for the best. Harold gives me a sorrowful look. You were barely four years old when mother passed. How can you know what she said or what she believed? I know because you told me. He nods to himself as he already knew what he would say. I am sorry, Homer. I have let you down. Don't be silly. Squint sold you into the army. It ain't your fault. You don't understand, he says, sounding mournful. I let it happen. I knew it was a sham, and I could have said no before I joined the regiment, but I wanted to be shut of the farm and our hard life. I wanted to breathe air that had never been dirtied by squint and leech. Oh, I say, there's worse. He hesitates, then takes a deep breath and continues. For once in my life, I wanted not to have to take care of you, not to be your brother and your mother and your father all rolled into one. I wanted out, Homer. I saw my chance and took it. Poor Harold looks so miserable, I can't hardly stand it. Besides the things he's telling me don't exactly come as a big surprise. I sort of knew it all along that he wanted to get away from Squint and not to always be having to look after his little brother. I say, it don't matter because you don't have to take care of me no more. It's my turn to take care of you. Harold studies me and shakes his head and smiles a little. How'd you get here, really? A boy your age that never left the farm? I'm about to tell you the story of my true adventures and all the fun and sorrows I had along the way when an officer starts shouting out commands. Men of the 20th Maine, move out. We're all shifting to the left. Keep formation, keep formation. The guards kick me out of the prisoner wagon, but chase me no farther than a few yards. It is easy enough to follow as the regiment picks up and moves along with the rest of the brigade. With the rest of the brigade. There are thousands of soldiers below the crest of the hill awaiting orders. Men from Maine and New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Vermont, Massachusetts and Connecticut, Michigan and Illinois, and just about everywhere in the northern states. The sound of rifle and artillery fire coming and artillery fire coming from the other side of the ridge is more or less continuous and the men seem eager to join the fight. This is the day they tell one another. Today we stand our ground. Today we turn our tables on Robert E. Lee. Today we win the war. I feel like tugging on sleeves and saying, don't be in such a hurry. The bullets are faster than you. But I keep my mouth shut and my eyes on the prisoner wagon, trying to scheme up a plan to break Harold out of his confinement. A little while later, I see the wounded being carried back from the top of the hill. And it comes to me that maybe being a prisoner and mutineer ain't such a bad thing to be. Nobody shooting at them could be worse. Then worse himself comes charging up on a big gray horse. Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the young commander of the 20th Maine, all fitted out with his sword and pistols and his fancy big mustache and his eyes glowing like he's been to heaven and seen the other side. Men of the 20th, look to me. See that small hill? He points with his sword. We must hold that with our lives. It guards the left of the Union Army. It guards the left of the Union Army and cannot be allowed to fall into rebel hands. Every man, every man on the double, run for the hill and take position. Follows the, follow the flag. Quickly now. He makes to wheel away and then thinks better of it. Instead, he sidles up to the prisoners and shows them the flat of his sword, tapping it against his boot. Gentlemen, those willing to fight will get a good word from me. Obey your orders and I'll do my best to get the charges dropped. To my dismay, the prisoners stand as one, including my brother Harold Fig, begging to be allowed to fight. The guards release them and they dust away the M on cruelly chalked, so cruelly chalked upon their uniforms. The prisoners and guards grab rifles and cartridges and cartridge boxes and run for the hill following the flag of the 20th Maine. So it's interesting, too, how they have different flags because we were reading um, in the early bird classroom, we were reading about uh, the story of Old Glory, the story of the flag. And so here's a special flag for that regiment there in Maine. All, but, but you know what? You also can then identify the regiment as well by that flag, right? <clears throat> All is confusion, but I managed to get to Harold just as he picks up a rifle 
Now's our chance, I say. There's no one to stop us. We can run for it. We'll be miles away before they notice. Harold looks at me like I got two heads. I gave my word, he says. Word won't stop bullets, I say, as he wrenches himself loose from the grasp. Words won't keep the shells from exploding. Words won't stop you getting killed and leaving me alone in this world. He shoves me to the ground. Stay there, he orders me. Crawl under the wagon and keep yourself safe. I will see you after the battle, Homer, after the fight is done. Then he's running up the hill, a rifle in one hand and a cartridge pouch in the other. Harold, stop. He won't stop. He keeps on going, running towards the sound of gunfire. What choice do I have? I haven't come all this way for nothing. So I follow my brother up the hill into the fight, into the Battle of Gettysburg. Even when they're dead. The top of the little hill is strewn with rocks and chapter 35 is strewn with rocks and boulders and a few spindly trees. The men from the 20th Maine spread out along the ridge, quickly finding shelter among the rocks. From here, they may fire down upon enemy and still be afforded some small protection. They don't have to wait long. Ten minutes after occupying the hill, a full regiment of Alabama men attack from below, waving their regimental flag. Suddenly, gray uniforms swarm among the rocks and into the open, surging upward with their terrible cry that is called a rebel yell. The Kayipi of the, the Kai. The Kai Yip Yip of the rebel yell being part ways an owl like screech and part ways a high pitched yelp that makes your skin crawl if you happen to be on the receiving end. The bullets start flying before I can locate Harold or find a place to hide. Bullets spitting off rocks and scudding up the dirt and making little smacking noises as they hit skinny trees that are too small to hide behind. Everywhere I turn, there are more bullets striking all around like hornets swarming. Snick, snick, snick. Finally, Harold scoots out from behind his rock and drags me to safety. What are you doing, you little fool? Do you want to be killed? Is that it? He asks, panting. I want to go home. Harold grunts, then takes him between the rocks then takes aim between the rocks and fires his Springfield rifle. His leather cartridge pouch lies open at the, his side and he swings the rifle around, tears the paper cartridge in his teeth, runs it down the muzzle, swing the right, swings the rifle back around, inserts the primer cap and cocks the hammer, all as quick as you can count. Then he takes careful aim and fires and does it all over again. There are 40 cartridges in his leather pouch, which means when he fires 37 more times, he'll be out of ammunition. Figure 20 minutes or less if he keeps up the, to, if he keeps up to speed. Where are you going, he cries, to get more ammunition. And that's what I do. Scampering down the back slopes of the hill, out of the line of fire, I follow the others and locate the powder wagon, hoisting a wooden ammunition box that looks like a little casket and dragging it up to where Harold is still loading and firing his rifle, steady as a clock, a bullet fired every count of 20. After seeing that Harold is well supplied, I make myself useful hauling ammunition to some of the others who are strung out all the way to the southern end of the little hill and under vicious fire from the troops below. This is where I write about the line of dead soldiers. Time and again, the Alabama men scream out their wild rebel yell and swarm up the hill only to be turned back at the last moment, punished by the men of the 20th Maine who hold their ground hunkered down among the rocks like smoldering barnacles, refusing to let go. For an hour or more, the bullets fly. Men are wounded, men scream, men die, but still the bullets fly. Colonel Chamberlain is everywhere. He strides along the ridge in direct line of the rebel sharpshooters firing from below, ordering where his men should be placed and how they might best repel the next desperate charge of the troops from Alabama. Bullets crease the air around him, close enough to part his hair, but he never flinches from his purpose. Later, I heard he was a college professor who knew nothing of war, excepting what he'd read in books. But that fateful day upon that the hill, the little hill, he seems to be Napoleon himself. 
never in doubt as to what must happen next. He orders where the men should move, when the line should be extended, and when the wounded should be dragged back to safety and carried by stretcher away from the withering fire. The bodies of the fallen have to be left where they fall to be retrieved when the battle concludes, if ever it does. Even when they're dead, bullets make them flinch. Seeing me scurrying along with a load of ammunition, Colonel Chamberlain pauses in his purposeful stride and says, You there, boy. Do you know the risk you take? Yes, sir. Very good. Carry on, he commands, and keep your head down. Then his attention is drawn elsewhere as one of his officers falls, wounded in the neck, and he must see to a replacement. In the first few minutes of the assault, the rebels almost gain the gain the top of the hill where they are met with pistol shot and sword a few soldiers fight hand to hand rolling among the rocks each one desperate to kill the other but most of the casualties are inflicted at a distance of 30 yards or so an alabama man will emerge from cover firing as he tries to gain a few yards and a main man will stand us will stand up exposed to the withering hail of bullets and take aim at the Alabama man, and most times one or the other will fall wounded or dead, sometimes both, all to gain advantage on a rocky little spur of a hill that happens to stand at the far end of the line where the Confederates hope to sweep around and crush the Union Army from both sides. A small hill shrouded in gray gun smoke and running with the blood of the wounded and the dead. The steady hail of lead chops little bits out of the trees like they are being attacked by small invisible axes. I keep down like Harold and the colonel suggested and find myself a good boulder to hide behind. All the ammunition has been taken from the wagons and distributed. I can't last forever the way the men are using it up, each taking two or three shots a minute. But for now, the gunfire spits and pops like a full load of popcorn in a hot pan of grease. Here comes a lull when only a few guns are popping off and I hear Harold call out for more ammunition. All gone, an officer shouts back. Find cartridges where you can. Already they are borrowing cartridges cartridge cases from the men who have fallen. The dead men don't object. In my hiding place, curled up small, I am praying the cartridges will run out soon so we can fall back. It comes to this. I care not if the rebels take the hill. There are a million hills in Pennsylvania. Let them have this one if they want it so bad. A little distance away, half obscured by the clouds of gun smoke, the colonel confers with the, his officers. From what I can see of their faces, the news must be very grim indeed. Good, I'm thinking. Sound your retreat. An army can't fight without bullets, can it? We are outnumbered, outgunned, and outfought. The only sensible thing to do is run for it. Then clear as a bell that tolls through the fog comes his order. Fix bayonets, he roars. All down the line, soldiers eagerly slip bayonets into the muzzles of their empty rifles and ready themselves for what happens next. Ahead of me, crouching behind the rock, my brother, Harold, shakes his head at me. Homer, get back, he shouts above the din. Go home. Save yourself. Then Colonel Chamberlain's voice booms out louder than the crack of artillery. Charge, he commands, lifting high his sword. Harold leaps to his feet and follows him down the hill into the guns of the enemy. To this day, I cannot say what made my, me follow my brother down that hill. It was not ignorance because I had seen what war does and hated it. It was not courage because fear of dying made me scream out loud. All I know is there I was running after Harold and begging him to take shelter. And as I come over the top of the hill and the air itself is hot enough to catch a fire from the heat of flying lead, to my shock, no more than 50 feet separates us from the enemy. Measured in blood, it might as well be a hundred miles. All around me, men are charging downhill, eyes wide in the madness of killing, teeth snapping like dogs at the scent of death. Fast as I am running over that rough ground, I can't seem to catch up to Harold. Soldiers on either side of him fall like ragdolls, but he keeps on going. Just ahead of him is the burly sergeant with the regimental flag, the one who cursed Harold, who cussed Harold and said he was a sw he was swamp trash. 
The sergeant stumbles, clutching at his stomach, and the flag starts to fall. Without breaking stride, Harold drops his empty rifle and seizes the flag from the wounded sergeant. Harold, no. Now all rebel eyes and rebel guns will be upon him. My brother holds up the flag as he advances, leaning into the lead-filled air as if he is leaning into warm summer rain. Harold, get down, I scream. Get down or be killed. Holes appear like stars in the billowing flag, but still he will not take shelter. I search for a rock to throw at him, to bring him to his senses. But the first thing my groping hand encounter, encounters is a fallen sergeant who passed the flag to Harold. He lies on his side, grimming at his pain, hands clawing at his wounded stomach. I want to ask him why he blackened my brother's eye and if he's sorry now, but it don't seem right to ask while he's busy dying. Instead, I lift the pistol from his holster and take aim, intending to fire at Harold's feet to get his attention. I pull the trigger. The bullet strikes the ground. Harold falls. At first, I think he has finally been struck by rebel lead, and then I see what happened. My shot has splintered away a chunk of rock that has stuck itself in his leg like a dart in a board. As Harold falls, he tries to keep the flag upright. Without thinking, I drop the sergeant's pistol, and somehow the flag ends up in my hand, and my brother's lying at my feet. By rights, I should toss aside the flag and drop to the ground and try to get under the flying lead, but something in me won't let it go. Now that the flag is in my hands, it don't seem right to let it fall on a bloody ground. A dumb idea, dumb enough to get me killed, but there it is. The strangest thing is happening all around me, all down the hillside. Rebel soldiers are throwing down their rifles and surrendering, begging mercy from their crazy men with the bayonets, men mad enough to charge without a shot to fire into the face of certain death, men who will not give up, men who would rather die than be defeated. Beneath me, Harold is groaning and trying to pry loose the sil a sliver of stone embedded in his leg. I am sorry he is hurt, but glad that he is alive. Then I notice that not all the Alabama soldiers have surrendered. I notice because one of them has risen from the ground and with his sword in both hands, his eyes moving from the flag to me as if he decided what to strike first, the hated Yankee flag or the boy holding it. He hesitates. At that moment, exactly, Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain appears and aims his pistol his pistol at the swordman's head with a steady hand. Surrender or die, he suggests. The man drops the sword and falls to his knees. I'll take the flag, the colonel says. See to your brother. Chapter 36. Huh. What happened in the end? That day the battle ends for us, but not for others. All that night, as I waited in the surgeon's tent with Harold, the wounded were carried from the field. Supplies were brought in. Meals were cooked or eaten cold. Artillery cannons were shifted into new positions. Men sang and cried and waited for the dawn, and when the sun rose, it did not seem so bad at first. A few skirmishes, a, a, few skirmishes, a cannonade or two, it was as if the rebels wanted only to give us a little slap to remind us they had not been truly beaten. Then, early that afternoon, the Confederate artillery began to fire in earnest, hurling thousands of explosive shells upon the Union positions, and the earth itself began to shake as if some mad giant was stamping his feet in rage. Our tent was more than a mile from the field of battle, but the shaking was so bad that water sloshed in the glass and dust arose and dust rose from the ground. One of the surgeons shouted that it was like an earthquake, but unlike an earthquake, it did not stop. Eventually, of course, it did stop, and the Confederates, thinking the Union artillery had been pounded into oblivion, launched an infantry attack into the very middle of the Union forces. They sent almost 13,000 men marching in line across a mile of open ground, and in that bloody mile pounded the Union artillery and hundreds of Union sharpshooters, Half of the Confederates were killed or wounded. Among those who participated in the doomed assault was Reginald Robertson Crockett, the gentleman spy, the man I knew as Professor Fleabottom, having bribed his way free of his jailers, paying them with the golden buttons on his coat. 
He rode hard for the battlefield and soon perished there, as his famous ancestor did at the Alamo, fighting to the last man. That night, Robert E. Lee and his rebel army fled south and would never again set foot on northern soil. A few days after the battle, while the dead were still being buried in the fields and meadows of Gettysburg and some of their fallen officers shipped home in boxes, Colonel Chamberlain came to see us. Harold's wound was healing nicely, so it seemed that the colonel had sent a telegraph message to Pine Swamp. So it seemed, and the colonel had sent a telegraph message to Pine Swamp, Maine, and received a reply. Harold's age was proved as 17. You are released from your service as being too young to enlist, the colonel informed him. Better words I never heard, although Harold was none too pleased. He wanted to keep on fighting once his leg had healed. Before he left us, the colonel turned to me and asked why I did it. Why did I stand my ground and hold the flag? You're only a boy and could have run away with no shame, he says, fixing his cold blue eyes on me. What made you stand? Try as I might, I could not think of an answer that day. And all those years later, I still cannot say why I did not run. Surely I wanted to, but something made me stay. If we, were, if we are still fighting in two years' time, the colonel said, I will send for you both. In two years' time, the long, terrible war finally came to an end, and we were never again called upon to fight. Instead, we wandered north, relying upon each other, working whenever we could on farms and small factories, and searching all the while for a medicine show as good as Professor Fleabottom's. We never did find one. Eventually, Jebediah Brewster located us in our wanderings and took us in and made us feel at home and was made our legal guardian. By then, the slaves had been freed of their bondage and the Brewster mines were opened up again, bringing precious stones out of the dirt and rocks. Mr. Brewster says me and Harold are like tourmaline. We come in dirty, but we will wash up shiny and he is proud to call us his kin and make us his heirs. It was him that suggested I write down my true adventures, so if you hate this book, put the blame on Jebediah Brewster, not on me. One more thing I got to say about my big brother Harold, and that's what happened after the battle at Gettysburg. At first his, wounded he, his wound healed, and for weeks it seemed like his leg would be saved. Then one day an infection set in, and it swelled up blue and nearly killed him. Nothing to cure it but the knife and the saw. My brother lost his leg. He still feels it sometimes like the ghost of a limb that used to be. When that happens, he will smile and say, Remember when we were boys? Remember how you saved my life by trying to kill me? Remember how you stood your ground, a small boy of 12 that never owned a pair of shoes? Don't you worry, little brother. Don't you shed a tear. Wasn't you that took my leg. It was the war. I think in some ways it's like that for all of us living with the ghosts of things that used to be or never were. We're all of us haunted by yesterday. And we got no choice but to keep marching into our tomorrows. Keep marching, boys and girls. Keep marching. Yours truly, mostly, Homer P. Fig. There are some additional Civil War facts, opinions, slang, slang, and definitions to be argued, debated, and cog. Cogitated upon? That would be a new one for me. It's kind of interesting. Arkansas toothpick, Civil War slang. Arkansas toothpick, a long knife. Beehive, a backpack. Big bugs, important people. Billy Yank, 
a Union soldier, bread bag, a supply bag worn over the, sh sol over the shoulder, a haversack, bumblebees, bullets, bummer, a soldier who deliberately lags behind, cabbaging, stealing, cabbage patch dolls, cabbaging, stealing, dog robber, a cook, fire and fall back, vomit and fear. 40 dead men, 40 rounds of ammo in the cartridge. Fresh fish, new recruits, go boil your shirt, take a hike, get lost, grab a boot, eat, gunboats, army shoes, horse collar, blanket roll, Johnny Reb, a Confederate soldier, layouts, coffee coolers, those who have those who avoided battle. Let them rip. Bring it on. Lucifer's. Matches. Oh my gosh. L matches were called Lucifer's. Oh my gosh. I love it. I'm getting some matches. I'm going to run around going, Lucifer, Lucifer. Muggins, a scoundrel. Old Scratch, the devil. Opening the ball, begin the battle. Pedal lead, shoot fast. Pie eater, a boy from the country. Rag out, dress well. Quick step, diarrhea. <laughs> Sharp operator, someone who could sell manure to a stable, a swindler. Shin plasters, paper money. Hmm. Showing the white feather, cowardice. A surprise. Squash maloshed or squash malished. A soldier with a hangover. Squash malished. That's probably what it is. Squash malished. Somebody's darling, an unidentified corpse. Sow belly, bacon. Spondulix. Spondulix. Money. Top rail, first class. Traps or trappings, a soldier's possessions, weevil fodder, hardtack, wrathy, angry. Then we talk about wrath in our spiritual classroom. So that's it, folks. That's it. We will start another book on Tuesday. Um, this is Dr. Annette Fairbridge. I probably likely will, will stick with the same theme and uh, read this book here as what we'll read. We're going to start on Tuesday with. Henry's Freedom Box. As you might know, in our bookless classroom, I'm doing the Civil War. We're still working up to it. We haven't even talked about the Civil War yet. But in the background, I picked this book by accident on the Civil War, and then I'm gonna and and I bought this book on purpose to read during this time as well. So we'll probably start with this book, Henry's Freedom Box: A True Story from the Underground Railroad. I don't know for sure. I may actually read this one. I probably actually will read this one in the early bird classroom instead. So, um, so start reading this in the early bird classroom. Yes, this one for the early bird. And I'll see, I might read, um, where'd it go? I know it's right there. It's underneath that big book. I need to keep them by my side, but I don't like to keep my books on the floor. Which is the Booker T. Washington book, which I can't find right now. Uh, but it's right here somewhere. So I might read that one for you, okay? All right, so this is Dr. Annette Fairwich. Thank you for joining me in the reading room. Why? Because I'm the teacher and you are here in the classroom. Thanks a lot if you're joining me live or if you watch it later on. I appreciate it.